You might be thinking right now, I got clickbaited, there is no way to stop Luka Doncic. And I agree with you, he can't be stopped. The only one stopping Luka Doncic is Luka Doncic. But there are ways of slowing him down. This analysis will be based on Mavericks and Clippers 7 game series. Since Los Angeles and coach Tyron Lu threw a lot of different defensive looks at Doncic. I watched and counted the efficiency of each option and we will combine those stats with the eye test. So stay with me until the end of this video to find out what exactly teams have to do to slow this Slovenian wonder kid down. For starters, let's all agree that this guy and his skill set are just unreal. Against the Clippers on isolation plays, Luka scored 1.32 points per possession. In Game 7 alone, he created 34 points in one-on-one -on -one situations. Not being the best athlete in the NBA, he makes up for it with his crafty footwork, height and strength. Clippers had so much trouble finding the right primary defender for him, since Beverly or Jackson are just too small and Luka was taking them to the post immediately. Nick Batum or Marcus Morris were often too slow and not strong enough for Doncic drives to the basket, while top-notch defenders like Kawhi and Paul George often also had no response for his crossovers and stepbacks. Speaking about his go-to moves, let's look at what he likes to do in post-ups. He loves to flow into these in early transition or simply when seeing a smaller defender near him. In Game 1, Clippers had Beverly on him and Luka immediately calls for the ball to move from the other side of the court. Mavs 5-out spacing with 4 shooters around the 3-point line makes it impossible to help for Beverly and Luka just bullies him to the basket. Doncic usually posts up on the right side of the court and it's all connected to his favorite move. Against defenders of his size, he tends to use strength to get closer to painted area and then turns over his right shoulder for this fallaway shot. Kind of reminds someone from Europe who wore Mavs jersey, huh? It's practically unguardable since the contact before the shot leaves defender out of balance and the fade makes it impossible to block it. So how do you stop it when Doncic is feeling his shot? The counter he uses is a spin move, but it's also what defenses should be looking to give him. Here we see Morris digging from one pass away and Jackson staying on Doncic's right shoulder, taking away the fallaway and inviting Doncic's baseline. The weak side has to be ready for help and even though Kawhi seems to be a bit late, he's saved by his unhuman length. Speaking about his isolations on perimeter, Doncic's back is just ridiculous. He has his favorite moves, counters to them and even counters to counters if defense is still in front of him. Number one option is obviously this pattern step back three to the left. He often takes them in secondary break, just coming at his own speed and then stepping back for a shot in the rhythm. Defenders are aware of this possibility since this is his trademark move, but there is not much you can do since Doncic is really tall for being a ball handler. It's not an easy shot, but Luka has mastered to stay in balance every time. After switches versus bigs, it's an easy choice for Doncic. Zubac is just too slow to stay close to him, so he keeps distance to not get blown by. He uses couple dribbles to freeze him, sees the hands down and then the step back makes it impossible for Zubac to even contest. Doncic has a number of different ways to get into step backs and one of them is using a right to left cross. If he can't create enough space with it, the counter is to do a little hesitation move to try to freeze the defender in the air and then drive left. Surprise surprise, even after beating the defender, Luka chooses this step back instead of going all the way in. In next clip, Zubac finally stays with him but Luka again creates space by using contact and making this ridiculous shot seem so easy. It is important to notice that Luka's preferred side to go is left. This is because going left for right-handed players is usually more comfortable to use the step back since it takes less energy to shoot the ball and it's just simply more natural. Knowing that, Clippers tried their best by forcing him to go right, where he doesn't have the possibility to use his step back. Sometimes it didn't work, as they opened up too much and Doncic simply just went all the way until the basket. Whenever they managed to stay close, Doncic showed off his counter moves. The best players always find ways to get back to their favorite moves, and this is why they are so great. Look at this behind the back into... Yeah, you saw it and you could have guessed it. Another step back. Notice the use of the left hand by Doncic while doing this move. He uses it softly to create more separation. And even though it sometimes can be called an offensive foul, refs almost always ignore it. 
Despite these counters, Clippers had more success when sending him to the right. These behind-the-back into step-back shots are insanely difficult to hit at high rate, especially when tiredness starts to kick in. Look at this perfect defensive sequence by Marcus Morris, not falling for any hesitation moves and maintaining enough contact. This next counter going right shows off his amazing footwork. Stopping on one or two feet, pivoting and turning again to shoot over his right shoulder is as hard shot as it gets, but this is just another proof of Luca's excellence. Here Paul George is right next to him after the spin, but Luca is smart. He bumps George with his chest, thus freezing him and allowing himself to raise up for this mid-range. As you already understood, Luca loves step backs and will find thousands of ways of getting into them. Obviously his repertoire is not only that, so every one-on-one -on -one he plays becomes almost unstoppable since he's so prolific at making tough shots. Now let's dive into his pick and rolls and how different defensive coverages worked against him. First of all, let's say that the idea of using drop with Zubac was one big mistake. You just can't allow a player so skilled at both shooting and creating have so much time and space. Especially when the team you're facing is also stacked with great shooters. Against drop in this series, Luka was the most effective, creating 1.56 points per attack and this number is just mind-boggling. Zubac started the first three games of the series and in each of those games Doncic got off to a hot start thanks to him. Here after a double drag Doncic gets attacking downhill and since Zubac is dropping Reggie Jackson is the low man and has to help on rolling Kleber. Doncic easily reads it and throws bullet pass to the corner for a hardaway free. When playing drop another thing you allow Doncic to do is this hostage dribble where he puts the defender on his back. He controls him so easily and then arrives at the rim with almost no contest as Zubac is strangely more worried about his man than Doncic. Also Luka is more than capable of knocking down these little floaters from the paint. Zubac's playing time decreased remarkably in the last two games of the series. He played only 8 combined minutes in game 6 and 7 when Clippers were down 3-2 in the series and needed to survive. Clippers won both and it gives us a first hint of what not to do against Luka. Do not play drop defense. With no Zubac on the court, Clippers relied heavily on small ball lineup, which allowed them to switch more. The advantages of switching are not giving up immediately open spaces to Doncic and not needing to involve other players to help since it basically becomes a one on one. Of course, we saw how unstoppable he is in isolations and in fact his efficiency against switching was similar. Against this type of defense, Doncic scored 1.23 points per attack, which naturally was near his isolation score of 1.32. I have to notice that this efficiency was influenced also by the poor Zubac, which in the first three games played not only drop, but sometimes also switched. Doncic shred him into pieces and it influenced his efficiency against switching in a good way. In games 4-7, to seven, Clippers switching defense allowed Mavs to pick their targets on offense. This is one negative of this system. When switching, you take away the best and primary defender of Doncic, allowing him to attack weaker defensive players instead of Kawhi. Nick Batum is not a bad defender, but I would choose Kawhi or Paul George every day of the week to guard Doncic instead of him. All the switching clips we see are from game 7 against Batum, where Luka was deep in his bag against the Frenchman. The beauty of NBA playoffs is following the matchup targeting done by the teams. When Clippers played their small ball lineup, Mavs knew they were switching, but you can't switch with Reddy Jackson or Luke Kennard, who are just too small to guard Doncic. So Mavs started targeting these two players, and Clippers responded with these guards hedging or showing, whatever you call it. Let's quickly go over pros and cons of this element. The bad is that you sometimes risk allowing quick open free, when the primary defender gets stuck and takes too long to arrive back to his man. Doncic hit a couple of those in this series, but Clippers were conscious about the risk and loss ratio so they continued to do it. Another minus with hedging or doubling is that it allows a higher possibility for offensive rebounds since after Doncic passes out the ball, the defense has to rotate and is not always on time to get back and box out. On the other hand, if Hedge is made well, Luka has to make couple dribbles versus the half court and it's already a win. Another win is that primary defender gets to stay on Luka, so Kawhi or Paul George are not forced to switch off of him. Also getting the ball away from the Slovenian prodigy is always a good idea. 
I personally would rather live by others shooting and trying to make plays, instead of having Doncic beat us one-on-one -on -one or creative pick and rolls. Of course, hedging allows the rolling big man to do the short roll and then attack four against three, which Mavs executed well a couple times in this series. But also, there were moments where Dallas was not able to capitalize attacking four and three, and it showed in the efficiency stats, where Dallas and Doncic created only 0.71 points per possession against hedges with small guards. That was the most effective defense that Clippers used, and it paid off big time in Game 7 where it was used 16 times and Mavs only scored 14 points. Now a question for all of you, and I want to see the answers in the comment section. Would you rather live with Doncic hitting ridiculous shots constantly, or give more space to his teammates to create and live with them sometimes taking open shots. Luca is so good at this game that an assignment to stop him requires ultimate measures. Doubling him anywhere on the court is one of them. Clippers decided to use traps on Doncic already in game 1, where Dallas was caught a bit off guard and scored only 10 points against 13 traps, which converts into a much lower efficiency than letting Luca run pick and roll freely or dominate in isolation. Here we see Clippers switch on Chicago action and Zubac remaining on Doncic. Beverly immediately comes to double, Luka gets rid of the ball and Clippers rotations clockwise work perfectly. Richardson has to invent something against George with 5 seconds on the clock, while Luka is on the other side of the court. Same situation again. Mavs target Zubac on pick and roll, Clippers switch and the double comes immediately. Morris and Zubac perfectly executes a nicks out and Richardson holds the ball again, doesn't create anything, then throws this high and slow skip pass which is not going to create anything ever and Finney Smith then turns the ball over. Life is good when you take the ball out of Doncic's hands, isn't it? Another example, Clippers again double from the closest man and Doncic is already waiting for a teammate to flash to free throw line. Dwight Powell arrives there a bit late, but look at Morris ignoring him and living with this mid-range jumper. Of course, doubling is risky since every time you start the play in disadvantage and when a team is prepared you could be in big trouble as Clippers were in Game 2. After struggling in Game 1, Mavs repaired a little scheme. After the switch happens, Mavs know that the Clippers come to double from right side and then rotates clockwise with one guy having to cross all the way to other side. In this case, it's Kawhi. So after Doncic passes out of double, he starts his run and so does Porzingis. There is no way that George or Beverly can recover so fast so deep and Mavs punish this double with a dunk. Being prepared for doubles helped Mavs close out game 2 with a win. Same situation again after 30 seconds but this time Doncic makes a different pass. Instead of horizontal one to Hardaway, Finney Smith flashes to free throw line creating all sorts of confusion for the Clippers. It leaves three Maverick players against two Clippers on that side of the court with their rotations completely broken. We can see that this time Beverly after double is coming back to Porzingis, even though Kawhi is still there, and Hardaway knocks down an open three. After this game 2 breakdown, Clippers returned with doubling only in game 7, where they did it 15 times. Mavs only scored 14 points against it, and it was the only way to stop Luka Doncic in that game, since he had 46 points himself, killing Clippers one on one. In double drag, Clippers were trapping Doncic. Porzingis here misses a pass to Boban inside against smaller Jackson, and later Clippers do a great job of flying around the court and closing out on shooters until one of these passes gets intercepted. Double drag again, trap on Doncic, short roll to Boban, who doesn't shoot and it leaves time for Clippers to rotate back. Ball gets stuck in Hardaway's hands and George forces a turnover. Not only doubling makes Luka a passer, but it also puts pressure on Luka's teammates to hit open shots after maybe not touching the ball for a while. It's a risky strategy to use, but if you mix it up a little bit and not let Doncic and his teammates get comfortable with it, it can pay you big dividends. It was the second most effective strategy against Doncic in this series, where he, well, his teammates average only one point per possession. So to conclude what we have seen in this video, what would be the ideal strategy trying to slow down one of the best players in the world right now? I don't think one constant defensive system can be successful since he is so good at adapting to new situations. Obviously you can't play passive pick and roll coverages, he is too good at scoring and creating at the same time. It would have to be some sort of combination between hedges and doubles 
which would force him to give up the ball as much as possible. Mixing in a little bit of switching with a small ball lineup is an option too. On isolation plays, you have to force him right since his step backs to left are just too deadly to be dependent on them. Force right, never jump on his fakes and try to make his teammates create as much as possible. Try to lower his percentages in offense by wearing him down on defense. Use full court pressure, attack him on defensive end where he's sometimes a bit lazy and definitely not elite. In this way, you might get back some points that he scored on you. Let me know in the comments what type of defense you would choose against Luka Doncic and don't forget to put a like on this video. See you next time.